All right, well, stand up with me, and we are going to look at Matthew 24, and uh, as you turn there, be reminded that this is God's holy word. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and every single word of it is inerrant and infallible, and is the only final authority in all that we are to believe and do. So be addressed by God in His Word, and we'll look at verses 1 through 14 of Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away. When His disciples came to point out to Him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the close of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise And lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word, this clear word from your Son. And even where there is confusion on our part, we know that there is no delay and no confusion on your part. For to you a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And so we pray with this hope that you will make clear to us those things that you desire to make clear to us, those things that are for our life and godliness, and not speculation, and not being alarmed, and not being led astray. So Lord, write this word upon our hearts and make us those kind of people that your Son intended as he spoke these words to those first disciples. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, The title here is the same title I used when I did Mark's Gospel about 13 years ago now, but I think in some ways Matthew's Gospel is a a more fitting recipient of this title because of the the extra details, that the emphasis that Matthew has. But Apocalypse Now and Begin, and again, uh, yes, it's a play on the movie, but not really. You'll see what I'm talking about because there is a dual fulfillment aspect here. Uh, now, about that word, it's not in this text. Uh, apocalypsis in the Greek is, uh, there's a lot of words in the Bible that are used for reveal uh, or appearance or something like that. And one of them is used here in verse 3, parousia. And that's only used four times in the Gospels and a couple times by Paul. But we get the word apocalypse. And in popular culture, I mean, you know, Zombie apocalypse. That's how, that's how much we, we cheapen the word. It's, it's a goofy word in American culture. But, you know, there's enough of it retained and we understand what it means. But it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the word is used in that context as a final reveal. It's an eschatological, last things kind of revealing. 
And it's not good news to everybody. In fact, even in pop culture, we tend to think of it as a very bad thing. But, it, but it's not to the Christian. And that's why Jesus wants to uh, tell his disciples these things. Now, this is called the Olivet Discourse because it occurs on the Mount of Olives. So if you ever hear that Olivet Discourse, it's just referring to this section. It's in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. It's recounting the same discourse with slightly different words at certain points, but not much. And there's been two main ways to interpret this whole discourse. I could get more complex, but just to keep it simple, do a little timeline thing. I always do this with my hands when it's helpful, I think. So on your left, my right, treat that as the past. And then over here on my left, your right, treat that as the future. So everything going this way. Two main views, for the most part, in popular modern evangelicalism. One is called preterism. And that is the idea that all of these prophecies in the New Testament not just Revelation, but here in Matthew 24, are things that happened at that time, specifically terminating on 70 AD, which is what Jesus has been building up to, this judgment that he ultimately, personally, is going to pour out on Jerusalem through the agency of the Roman armies. And so all these different prophecies in full preterism are uh, things that happened in AD 70. Now, on the other extreme, you have full futurism. And that is the idea that all of these things are always talking about something about the second coming of Christ and the final judgment. And then you have sort of on a spectrum partial preterism, which I guess is partial futurism, because there you're saying, well, he's mainly talking about AD 70, but there's some things that obviously have to be talking about the end. Most notably, the second coming of Christ, the literal bodily second coming of Christ, the resurrection, where he raises the righteous and the unrighteous, and then the final judgment. At the very least, those three things have to be outstanding. Uh, those things could not have been fulfilled in AD 70. Now, full preterism, not to turn this into an eschatology class, is a heresy because it denies those three things that are part of the gospel hope. But those are the ideas that, that come into Matthew 24, just like it does the book of Revelation. And so just to be aware, I'm going to be talking about that in the next couple of weeks as we go through Matthew 24. And so um, a, a partial preterist or, or somebody that's on that side of things is going to see the more cosmic imagery, because I know you're going to think to yourself, well, wait a minute, what about when he gets down to this imagery of the sun and the moon and the stars and the, all that stuff? What, is a, what does a preterist do with that? Is he kind of, and what he does is he sees that as symbolic, and he'll point to Old Testament passages where God's judgment, even on those old cities, was described in the same terminology as the sun and the stars falling and all those different things. But again, that's just the lay of the land, and that might seem complex, but we're actually just going to make it really easy for today, the outline. Number one, and you'll see why I call this apocalypse now and again, those two points. First, we'll see one now and again answer. Jesus' answer to them, I'm going to show you, is a now and again answer. And then we're going to see 10 now and again signs. From verses 1 to 14, we're going to see 10 signs that are the, sort of the unpacking of his answer, and those are all going to be now and again signs, and they have to be. And I'll show you that. And here's the big idea if you get lost at any point, the judgment on Jerusalem was a type of the ultimate apocalypse to come. So there is an apocalypse that Jesus is talking about. He is going to, in a sense, appear in judgment. The Old Testament would speak like this, where God visits you in judgment, or sometimes visits you in mercy. And it doesn't actually mean that God came down at that time. Now here he does come down in the incarnation in Christ. But then Jesus is raised well before this judgment in A.D. 70. So Jesus is talking about a divine judgment on Jerusalem for their sins. But that apocalypse is just a sign. It's real, real history. But it's a type and shadow of the ultimate apocalypse to come. So that's our big idea. Now let's get to what I mean by this now and again answer. Jesus is replying 
uh, to an observation that the disciples made. It says there in verses 1 and 2, they're coming out, and, they're, and what are they looking at? They're looking at the splendor of the temple. It's almost like for a brief second, they didn't hear anything from chapter 23. He's judging Jerusalem. If anything, they should have pity on Jerusalem like he did. But within five minutes or, I don't know, an hour or two, they, they, they lose their mind. They're looking up at the temple and they say, man, this is amazing. This is beautiful. This, this is impenetrable against some enemy force or whatever. They're, they're just in awe of the temple. And then they're headed toward the Mount of Olives. And here's what it says. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them. So he's bringing correction to them too. You see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You might think in, uh, of John 2 where he says something similar to the Pharisees. But he said, at least they thought he did. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they're saying, it took 40 years to build this temple. They thought he was talking about the physical temple. And so uh, that was obviously a big claim from their perspective. But Jesus actually was making that claim in a literal sense, too. So in reply to that prophecy, the disciples raise a question. Now look down at your Bible to see their question in verse 3. Notice there's a when and there's a what. You could even divide it into three parts. But there's a when and a what. As he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him. See, there's a separation. He sat down on the Mount of Olives, indicating so that it's time. They're mulling this over. Like, what is he talking about? So they say they go to him. They come to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, I cheated there. I said, and, you know, they may not have. And I'm going to argue they probably didn't. They're just stacking one thing on another, but they see this all as one thing. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When and what? But that's a two-part question, isn't it? Sproul says in one of his, uh, I'll be making reference to this book, The Last Days According to Jesus. We read it as a men's group. But he says, only one of the three accounts includes the question about the coming of Christ and the end of the age. The question is reported by Matthew, but omitted by both Luke and Mark. Now, of course, we all know that it only takes one time in Scripture for something to be taught for it to be taught. So if the Scriptures say anything even one time, it's totally teaching that thing. Now, the preterist, what does he do with all this? The end of the age. Well, he sees that as the end of the Jewish age. And in a sense, the disciples would have too. If you were an Israelite at that time, and that fits Matthew's emphasis on Israel's judgment. But the argument can easily be made the other way too. The disciples themselves understood that very thing as the end of the world. Uh, by the way, Americans do that too. I, I didn't think to say that when we were doing the men's study, because you know this is, we're trying to get our heads back into their context and say, now, if you were a first century Jew, how would you understand the end of the temple, the end of Israel? You'd see it as the end of the world. You're the center of the world. Your Messiah is the king of the whole world. He's obviously, if he's going to bring an end to this, he's going to bring an end to everything. He's going to bring an end to all of his enemies. Americans do this. We don't think we do. But you start talking about things going on in this global government, or you see persecution against Christians, or you talk about Jesus doing this and his providence, and what happens if America goes down? And the first response you get from anybody is, oh, you're saying that you know that the end is near? Or, or you know who the Antichrist is? Or, or you're, you're one of those people, and they start pegging you in a certain group, and it's like, huh, what did this person just hear? And it's evident after about 30 seconds that when they hear the end of America, they hear the end of the world, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's human nature. You know, we're the center of the world. Like, what's going to happen? And it's, it's a very understandable way to think. But the Israelites thought like that times a, a billion because they really did have God's blessing. They really were the spiritual center of the universe. So the disciples themselves understood things as the typical Jew, the coming of the Messiah, judgment upon the temple, if there was any, the end of all things. They saw that all as one thing. Calvin says in his commentary that the temple would stand till the end of time was a premise that they had. 
Uh, Sproul actually makes reference to Calvin's quote there, and yet he concludes that this means that Jesus was answering a question that contained a false assumption. So in other words, Jesus is going to correct the disciples' two-part question by a one-part answer. And um, I actually disagree with that, and most commentators do. I have to ask the first question, if Jesus is answering a two-part question because they didn't know any better, with just uh, not based on their false assumption, one problem with that is that Jesus is always doing that. Jesus in the Gospels is always answering questions that are not informed questions, and He's not correcting everything about their question all at once. He's giving them the parts that are most pertinent. But the second thing I would say to that is that Jesus, if we remember, is the ultimate fulfillment of the prophets of Israel. And how do the prophets of Israel always speak about the future? If you study this out in the Old Testament, you'll see that they spoke about the day of the Lord and the coming of the Messiah, and you read the prophecy and you're like, huh, that part pertains to the first coming of Christ. That part, though, that's, that doesn't happen until the second coming. And that happens again and again and again in the Old Testament prophets. And biblical scholars will call this prophetic pers perspective. They'll call it dual fulfillment. They call it different things. But Jesus was an Israelite prophet. He was just the ultimate fulfillment of the prophet. He speaks, not coincidentally, like a Jewish prophet. And so you have two reasons to reject this idea that if the disciples asked an, an ill-informed question, Jesus had to correct everything about what they were saying all at once. I would just say they asked a two-part question. Jesus is giving them a two-part answer, even if they didn't understand it. I think that's the better way to read it, and I think some of the majority of commentators come to. Now, the audience here is something that the preterists are going to point to. The audience is you. And you say, me? And, uh, well, not yet. Because it's in the second person, it's in the plural, but the first thing you always want to ask when you're interpreting the Bible is, who's he talking to? Who's your audience? Well, obviously, I think we'd all agree that in the Gospels, when he's talking to the disciples, the first audience is always the disciples. Then you have to do the hard work of seeing, okay, how much of this pertains just to them and how much of this pertains to us? But the burden of proof might seem to be here on the futurists because you say, well, if you look at this whole chapter, Jesus is talking about, and we'll get to this, this generation. He's speaking to you. He's speaking about this temple right here in front of your eyes, which is not the same thing that we can look at now. And so they'll say, well, you futurists, if you want to say that this pertains to anything off in the future, the burden of proof is on you to show how any of this would pertain to something thousands of years down the road. Well, Let's get some balance in here. There's an important expression that's used here, and it's also used in Mark 13, 7, where Jesus says, the end is not yet. And here, it's in verses 6 through 8, and it seems to carry the sense of a longer interval of time, especially when you read it in the context of the words just before and after. So here's what he says in verses 6 through 8. He says, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place... But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. This is an important passage to the rest of these two chapters. First of all, there's an imperative to that immediate audience. He says, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. That's something we need to hear all the time, not just in our personal lives, but about sensationalistic things that are happening out there. But then after the words, the end is not yet, notice there's a plurality of catastrophes that are set before their minds, almost as if it's a parade that has no obvious termination point. And then the exclamation point, all these are but the beginning. Beginning of what? Beginning of all the same things. All of this is to say that Jesus gives them a now and again answer to a now and again question, even if they didn't understand that. The disciples, I'm not saying, uh, got this even after the end of the chapter. They may have got it later, and you see there's evidence of that in their epistles. In their minds, this is all one cloth. 
When they ask, when's the temple getting destroyed? When, when is God going to bring vengeance on all of his enemies? They're thinking all. They're thinking all or nothing, now or never, that sort of a thing. And, and why wouldn't they? As I said, that's human nature. So that is the answer. There's one now and again answer. Now let's start to unpack the answer in our second point with these 10 signs. And as you go through these 10 signs, just ask yourself, does it make sense that these are talking about something that only happened in AD 70 or leading up to it, or that there's something that only happens right at the end, right before Christ returns, which you couldn't know anyway, because he's very clear, and we'll see this in verse 36, that no one knows the day or the hour. So how does it function either way? So just have that in your mind, and here's the 10 signs I have in mind, and just look down at your text. I'll just summarize them. Number one, false Christs in verse 5, false Christs that lead astray. Now, by the way, just real quickly on that, when he, he says, many will come in my name saying, I am he, uh, I don't have any resolution on this, but I remember the first time I ever looked at it, and I haven't gotten any smarter, I'm thinking, okay, does that mean that the people he's talking about will claim to be Christ? I am he. Or does he mean people that direct you to Christ, claiming to be Christians, say Joseph Smith or somebody that you know starts some other cult, and says, well, of course I'm a Christian, and that's Jesus, but they will deceive. And the answer I've come up to is, well, I guess it could mean either. Either one of them could deceive you, so there are these false, false Christs. Uh, secondly, wars and rumors of wars in verse 6. Third, the rise and fall of world kingdoms in verse 7. Fourthly, the material crises of famine and earthquake, also verse 7. By the way, see how normal all these look? This is, this is a huge key. Number five, persecution against Christians even unto death in verse 9. Number six, apostasy in verse 10. And, and that, by apostasy, I mean a falling away from the faith. And of course, that includes all the other things you turn against each other, and we'll look at some verses that talk about that. Eighth, an increase of lawlessness in verse 12. And nine, as a result of that, love growing cold, also in verse 12. And then finally, the gospel going forth to all nations in verse 9. Now, that last verse especially has caused most commentators throughout the ages to say that this points to a literal end of time. Notice the words, throughout the whole world and to all nations. Uh, Hendrickson in his commentary also points to verses 29 and 31. I know we'll get to this, but the astronomical signs. As I, I know, the Old Testament has those in a, in a symbolic way, and that's what preterists will point to. But, but there's some reasons uh, to not go with that. And I'll, I'll talk about that, if not next week, the week after. But I agree with Hendrickson. Uh, much more difficult for the preterist is the reference in chapter 25, verse 31. You can sort of move your finger over to that or turn the page. In chapter 25, verse 31, in the middle of that parable, oh, sorry, this is the beginning of the parable. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all angels with Him, now, this is referencing the same coming of the Son of Man. It's the same context. But he follows it immediately with that parable of the final judgment. So why call these what I'm calling now and again signs? I mean, maybe we can divide these up into two categories. Maybe uh, some of these were fulfilled in A.D. 70. Some of these are, and people do that. In fact, I used to do that. I used to look at the chapter and say, well, maybe it, it cut the chapter right here, and this part of the chapter refers to AD 70, and this other part of the chapter refers to the future. And you sort of picture dual fulfillment like a glass of water. And you pour out half of that body of water back here at AD 70, and then you pour out the rest over here. And that's what dual fulfillment means. Part of it's there and part of it's that. That's almost never the way the Bible treats dual fulfillment. And I'll talk about that in just a second. You could do that at first. There's obviously there's some verses that do treat prophecy like that. But let's start by asking whether each of these things really can be defined in that way. Preterists will point out about false prophets and false Christs, verse 5 and verse 11. False prophets and false Christs, which there Jesus isn't repeating himself. 
He's talking about two distinct things, false Christs, people that are actually claiming either their Christ, like I said, or claiming some other Christ. But then you have just regular false prophets, which many verses you can cash out as false teachers. But one preterist says, quote, During the government of Felix in A.D. 53 to 60, Josephus tells us that the country was full of robbers, magicians, false prophets, false messiahs, and impostors, who deluded the people with promises of great events. My response to the author would be, you mean like today? It's like, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing today. Now, there are intensifications, as we're going to see, that things like that, <clears throat> excuse me, get worse, and that's why he's telling us this. He's obviously not telling us something that's just always the same in every way. But something like that gets worse and worse and worse. So something to keep in mind there. But most significantly about all these signs is the way that verse 8 comes right in the middle and seems to be correcting an aspect of the disciples' question. He says, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. So why do I say that's correcting? So they're admiring the temple at one second. The next second, they're completely troubled. And that's why they go and ask him and say, whoa, whoa, when's this going to happen? So he has to say, hold on. So the rest of this is really just a matter of, hold on. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Hendrickson comments about that. They mark the beginning, says Jesus. They do not mark the end. That's pretty crucial. He says, therefore, do not be alarmed. So what marks the beginning? The whole list, these mark the beginning. Natural disasters, man-made tragedies, persecution, demonic-level deception, even the collapse of someone's whole temporal order. These have been the rule, not the exception. These are types and shadows of what will be intensified as midnight approaches, both on Jerusalem and ultimately on the end of the world. Types and shadows. Recall the words of Peter. He's going to use the same kind of language of the house of God versus those outside. In 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, he says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, you could say, well, he's just talking about the the chastisement that God brings upon the church to discipline us, and then the greater judgment of those outside. I think that's a legitimate application, but Peter's also quoting from an Old Testament passage. And so he is writing to the exiles. If you look at the beginning of his letter, the exiled Jews that are dispersed to all these different places. So there's something very much Jewish house of God there, judging that first and then judging the nations. By the way, you see that in Paul too, in Romans. So in Romans 1, 16 and 2, 7 and 9, he doesn't just say that the gospel brings salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He also talks about judgment to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why is that? Read the rest of Romans 1 through 3. The Jews have, in a sense, a greater, stricter judgment due to their greater knowledge and their place uh, in, in God. And so as the final sign here in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Now, what does a preterist do with that? Well, they're going to point to statements like Paul in Colossians 1.6, that the gospel has come to you, you Gentiles in Colossae, as it has also in the whole world has, past tense. So the whole world there, it's like in Acts 1.8, before Pentecost, when the disciples wanted to know, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Well, first he says, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But then he says, but you will be my witnesses, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you so that you will be my witnesses. And then what does he do to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
So there is that dynamic there that sometimes the ends of the earth or the nations means those, the known world, that the apostles would have known it at that time. But as we'll go through this chapter, we'll realize that it can't just mean that. Okay, so very, very important. Uh, Just two applications today. Uh, You might think to yourself, I didn't know I was coming to an eschatology class today. Uh, I'm interested in end time stuff, uh, but I missed that class. By the way, that's one of the applications. You should go back and and watch the eschatology class. One of the reasons I did it, by the way, is because I knew this part was coming up. And let's face it, um, the view that most American evangelicals have of end times comes from fiction, comes from novels. Uh, It sells movies, not sure why, they were bad movies, but it does, and that's what people, it's it's sensationalistic. Um, it's It's what puts people in the seats, it's what sells money and all these different things. And uh, so I would just recommend that uh, because it was meant to sort of prep people for the grammar, you know, words like preterism, future, who uses words like that? Um, So that's one of the applications. Now, as far as how to interpret this passage, I'm not usually uh, in the habit, if you know me, of disagreeing with R.C. Sproul about much, but his own position on this passage and, and his partial preterism in general, in my opinion, was driven too much by his motive to answer a particular objection of modern skeptics. And I greatly sympathize with that. I love apologetics, and I definitely think that we should be silencing the skeptic. I can point to scriptures that give um, the church that role. And so the, the Albert Schweitzers of the world and the Bertrand Russells of the world, those atheistic skeptics or Christian skeptics, in Schweitzer's case, at the turn of the 20th century, they present the challenge of Jesus and the apostles being wrong about their expectation that the kingdom of God and that God's judgment on all his enemies would happen in their lifetime. And they point to passages like this to make their case that the Bible was an error or something like that. And so what does Sproul and others want to do? They want to answer this challenge of the skeptic. And so the Olivet Discourse can become a battleground, not just between Christians arguing about end times, but it can become a battleground of answering that skeptical objection. And so his book, The Last Days According to Jesus, in my opinion, weighed too heavily uh, heavily in the preterist direction in order to answer uh, those objections. And the easiest way to do that is to interpret everything Jesus is saying as fulfilled in A.D. 70. And so there's no unfulfilled expectation because it all did. Everything he's talking about did happen in A.D. 70. And one of the things I would say to that, since we're going to be in this text for three weeks, is that there's no need to do that in the first place. If there is a dual fulfillment, if there is an apocalypse now and then a final one at the end, well, then the first fulfillment is sufficient to make the point. And a second fulfillment doesn't in any way undo the first. So as I mentioned in our eschatology class, I think Sproul allowed the possibility of dual fulfillment, but he understood that concept exclusively in terms of partial fulfillment. Remember the analogy I just used of the water pouring out half of it in AD 70 and then the other half at the end of time. But that's not the main way that the Bible talks about the fulfillment of prophecy. The main way it does is with typology. And I've used the word type a couple times, and I'm going to use it a couple times in the next few weeks, but it's a Bible word. The book of Hebrews talks about it a lot, and it talks about things in the Old Covenant and the ceremonies and all these different things as copies or shadows or types or sketches. It uses different words of heavenly things. And so you not only have all these things in the Old Testament that prefigured Christ this way, but really even the fulfillment in Christ, all of these things are shadowing something that is ultimately real in heaven. And that's the way Revelation speaks, and that's the way the Olivet Discourse speaks. So that you have this ultimate thing, this ultimate reality in the heavens, and all of these things are pointing up and pointing forward to an ultimate fulfillment. So one of the things I would just say by way of application is, please, it's not a shameless plug, it's just uh, 
go back to the eschatology class and listen especially to those weeks in the millennium and on this whole preterism type stuff and, and, and on Revelation. And I think it would be very helpful for understanding what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24. But what's the punchline? What's the personal takeaway from this passage? If we're not there in the first century, but on the other hand, there's something about it that we're still looking forward to. And I can kind of see that there is a punchline, but what is it? Well, there's two that are in the passage. We don't have to guess what the lesson is. In verses 4 and verse 6, Jesus gives us two imperatives. See that no one leads you astray. See that you are not alarmed. And in fact, many have been led astray precisely by false alarms. There's a lot of cults that have started from end-time speculation. And even if you don't go as far as a cult, you can get wrapped up in fixated and obsessed over things that Jesus specifically tells us you cannot know the time or the hour. And we take our eye off the ball and we start focusing on peripheral things instead of on the gospel. So see that no one leads you astray and see that you are not alarmed. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul speaks about growing up in the knowledge of Christ, and specifically, he makes this same sort of thing the reason for that maturity. He says, after he says for us to grow up into the knowledge of Christ, he says, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Now, you might think of things like false Christs, or even false prophets, you may not think of those as things that are swirling around you all the time. But truly, they are legion in times of disorder. You may not think about it, but when things are crumbling and you're looking for some order, there's always some huckster, there's always some charlatan that's going to come in here and start pointing to peripheral sensationalistic things to take our eyes off the ball. So we cannot heed Jesus' double call here to not be led astray and to not be alarmed until or unless we grow in the knowledge of Christ. I hate to be repetitive, but one of the main applications to a lot of texts in Scripture is simply we have to grow in this area of knowledge. And we do that through learning. That's part of what the church is. We study Scripture. We study it systematically, too. We don't just memorize parts of Scripture, that we do classes that are focused on particular areas so that we're immune We're impervious, in a sense, by God's grace against these every winds of doctrine. So let's close with that and pray. Father, we thank you for your word that warns us, that clarifies things for us, even as there are things that you have kept secret. Yet, as you say in your word, the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And here, as you tell us to not be alarmed, to not be led astray, let us look to the future not as speculators of the unknown, but as celebrators of the known, those that see your grace for us in the future and that know that we have a perfect foundation and a perfect hope. Keep our mind on that good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.